Uh, today, I want to take us to uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, one of the great prophets uh, that we learn about of, of the Old Testament. I want to take us to Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And I want you to listen to the words that, uh, that I read that, that come from, uh, from Isaiah's ministry. And I want you to be thinking about what do these words mean to you? What do they mean to you as an individual? What do they mean to us as a community of faith? What does it mean to us as people um, charged with bringing the light of Christ into the world? So listen to these words. Again, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. And that's what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out over to the earth, and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you, and you will make to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. And that means that we're to be a light into the world as Jesus was a light into the world. We are to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, and that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place. And new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. I love these words because uh, it's so important, especially that, that piece at the end, um, these words spring forth. And when you think of something springing forth, you think of something jumping out at you. You think something coming to life for you. And, and each time that, that we get into God's word, uh, I, I want to just kind of put that out there for us. Uh, when you read the Bible, when you spend your days, however you do, in reading God's word, never take a story or a part of scripture for granted. Some of us have been in our faith journey for a long time. And sometimes we go back and we read parts of Scripture where we say, well, I know that story and I don't need to read it again. But trust me, every time you read the Word of God, something new will come. And every time you read the Word of God, I want to encourage you to ask, these, ask this question, Lord, what are you teaching me today? So today Isaiah is, is teaching us about um, what it means to be a people who are called into a greater life that comes in to the way of the Lord of Jesus Christ. You know, here in America, we're pros at times of uh, juggling whether or not we'll get involved in something. There's so much that happens in our country. There's so much that happens in our communities, even in our churches. And we, we make choices about what we decide to be a part of or what we don't. There are some things that we will choose to embark on. There are some things that, that we will just say all together, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. But I guess what, where I come from with where Isaiah is leading today is when it comes to being a person of God... I think the challenge that comes before us is that we do have a choice, and that choice is that God calls us to choose to be his disciple. He calls us to choose to be his light. So the question this morning becomes, so how do we make a difference in our life? How do we make a difference that comes from that? It starts with a word that I think so often we lose sight of in society. And this word sometimes when, when you hear a pastor say this word or maybe your spouse will say this word or your boss will say it, uh, sometimes we get a little unnerved when we hear someone saying that we need to give more about this. And that word is commitment. That word commitment is one of those words that, that for whatever reason changes or can shape us. And depending upon how we uh, encroach or approach that word, we'll say a lot about uh, the days in which we move forward in life. Uh, commitment is so important. You know, I officiate weddings, and I remember a couple of churches ago, um, I officiated a wedding, and I remember asking uh, the, the man this question. I said, will you love this woman to be your wedded wife? Will you care for her? Will you honor and comfort her in sickness and health and forsake all others? Keep only under her as long as you both shall live. And his response was, I'll try. I mean, I think I will. Yes, I will. <laughs> 
And sometimes that's how we approach commitment, isn't it? Sometimes I think commitment moves us in that direction where we say, well, I'll try, or, or I think so, or, or yes, I will. And, and what we have to come to the understanding of is that commitment calls for us to take a stand. What is commitment? Um, I think commitment is a pledge. It's a, it's a promise. Commitment is, is defined as something that, that means action. And commitment is something that, that, that we feel deep into the depths of our heart. And depending upon what we're looking at, we realize that if we're going to be committed about something, that means we can't sit on the fence and depend upon what people say or don't say or our desire to be liked or accepted uh, by others that we're willing to tip either way depending upon how the wind is blowing. Commitment means taking a stand in something. And that's what Isaiah's message is saying to us this morning. Isaiah points out what it means through the life of Jesus to make a commitment as ourselves as disciples into the world. Again, here's what he writes. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. So God is saying he wants to enter into a covenant with us, his people, and he is asking us to make the commitment to be a light, to not have cold feet about that, but to be a light into the world, to open the eyes that are blind, free captives from prison, release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. So if commitment is so important, and if we're kind of maybe agreeing a little bit this morning, yeah, commitment, I get that, Pastor. Why is it so hard then uh, for us to make commitment a priority? I think a couple of things happened with that. I think sometimes we realize that it's tough for us to make commitment a priority because the word obedience comes into play when we think of commitment. Now, you know, when you think about being obedient, um, Obedient to one another is one thing. Obedience to God is, is, a, is a totally different thing. But obedience comes into play. So through obedience, God reshapes our life. Through obedience, God helps us to become the person that he created us to be. Through obedience, it means that we sacrifice ourself and set aside whatever hopes, desires, and dreams that we place before us as the goal of life, and we, and we take that as second chance Seeking God's will, seeking God's desire, seeking God's direction. The scripture uses the wonderful metaphor that God is the potter, we are the clay. And what does a potter do with clay? He throws the clay, or he or she throws the clay, and when they throw it, they begin to mold it and make it into something that is useful, something of greatness. So, so Isaiah calls us to fill our life this morning with obedience, but living in obedience is not always easy to do, as I said earlier. But when we step out into obedience, we find out that living in obedience, we see a change or a transformation in our life. Why? Because we begin to start living and becoming like God. God says, be holy as I am holy. God says, here is the path of life that I have called you to walk. He invites us to walk that path. And out of obedience, we get there. But here's the truth. The truth is, as much as we want to be obedient, the truth is, as much as we think we can be obedient, that something will come along our way and distract us. Maybe you can think of something in your life where recently you were wanting to be obedient to something, but then something came along and either got your interest or changed your trajectory of the direction where you were heading, and you were totally off base with the obedience that was there. Obedience in Christ is something that's important, and we don't want it to lead to disobedience. There was a lawyer who was trying to probate a will and um, called and needed the services of a pastor. So he called up the minister and he says, I need you to come down to my office as I'm probating this will and there's a special service that the will has asked that you as a pastor shall do. So the pastor gets in his car, he drives down there, he comes into the lawyer's office and he says, what is it that you need my services with today? And the lawyer says, well, you need to conduct a funeral service for a family member. And the pastor said, fine, I do funerals all the time. He said, it's for Shep the dog. <laughs> and the minister says, wait a minute. He says, I don't do funerals for animals. In fact, some will even question whether animals have a soul. I refuse to do that. And the lawyer said, but pastor, you don't understand. My client left a half a million dollars for this to happen. And the pastor said, wow, you didn't tell me old Shep was a Baptist. <laughs> Obedience. What is it that we'll be obedient with? 
And what is it that will bring that obedience fear? So for us to be obedient to God means that first, we must remove the distractions that are in our lives. What are those things that steer you away from God? What are those things where Isaiah says, be a light to the Gentiles, where Isaiah says to bring sight to the blind, to release the captives of prison, and all of those wonderful images that we see, what are the distractions that keep us from doing that? Isaiah calls us into that. Now, for some of us, it might be through addictions. Maybe an addiction uh, puts a block up for us. Maybe we're addicted to sex. Maybe we're addicted to drugs, pornography. Maybe we've committed some sins in our lives that that we think are just uh, overwhelming us, like adultery. Or maybe we've committed an even greater crime as a felony or something. Something has stopped us from seeking obedience in our life. And God says it's time to clear our vision. And it's time to take the step to remove ourselves from that which binds us from our past, that we might move ahead for a cleaner life into the future. The Bible also says that we're to be a witness to obedience. And here's a couple places we find that. In 1 Peter 1.14, it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. Living in ignorance means that we're moving away from God. Living in ignorance means that we're ignoring What God has to say, living in ignorance means that we're choosing to live our life the way we darn well want to. And living in ignorance is not the direction that God says. Paul, the great apostle, he he talks about this as he's moving from church to church, as he's planting new church, New Testament communities all throughout as he becomes one of the leading apostles to begin the birth of Christianity all throughout Asia Minor. Paul writes in Romans 12 too, he says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. In order to move into obedience and out of ignorance, we must pursue the mind of Christ. And in pursuing the mind of Christ, it is there that we can clearly see what the will of God is. So for Paul, when our heart and our minds are aligned with the will of God, Paul says that we will begin to see God's plan unfolding in our life. And that is a significant piece. Here's the second thing that we learned from the passage of Isaiah this morning. Isaiah says that that it's a call for accountability, that you and I must be accountable. One of the greatest signs that commitment is lacking around us is the fact that we, we don't want to be held accountable for our decisions. I think this is probably something that's growing rampant in the world today, where, where, where we want to blame others for our circumstance. When something doesn't go right in our life, we're quick to say that it's someone else's problem, or because they did this, it led to this harm upon us. Yeah, that can be true in some instances, but most of the things that I'm aware of is that you and I must be held accountable for the decisions that we make. And we must see that those decisions that we make sometimes bring goodness to our life because we're following the path of God. And sometimes, yes, it does bring tragedy to us because we've made decisions that bring harm upon us. You know, we we learn from uh, Ezekiel's writing, he said, if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people that the sword will take the life of one of them, he says that I will hold the watchman accountable by his blood. We're to... We're to call out for each other in a sense that if we see danger or impending doom, or if we see one of our own who, who is making a, a decision that will train wreck their life, we, we are held accountable, and we are to lovingly bring and come alongside of others. And we're to say, we're here to love you. We're here to help you to see the greater good. And we need to see that in our own life as well. To have commitment in life means that we also um, are obedient to God and we have to accept accountability for our actions in the world. But accountability can't happen and it can't stand on its own unless we do this last thing. And that's we must surrender fully. Surrender. Now these are some bizarre words, aren't they? Especially as we celebrate the 4th of July weekend where we talk about independence. We know that independence and continued freedom comes at a cost. We as a nation and we as a world, we look at a word like surrender and we want to run the other way because we think that that means defeat. Surrender in biblical terms means quite the opposite, friends. It means to empty ourselves and to make the Lord the priority. It means that that we are to seek God's desire. We are to seek God's will. We are to seek God's obedience in all the things that we do. But sometimes it's a struggle, isn't it? 
I think most of us wake up every day and we, we want to see God's work done in our life. I believe with all my heart that every day that we get up and we, we want to see God work through our lives, every day we get up, I truly believe that we want to make God-honoring decisions. And sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes it's a struggle because where we say that we have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, what we really may have done is to purposely, or superficially I should say, made a public affirmation, but has it really uh, changed who I am as a person? So surrender goes beyond coming to church on Sunday. Surrender goes after church on Sunday. Surrender follows us throughout the week. Surrender says, who am I when others aren't watching? Surrender means giving my life to Christ for the greater good. A couple of people that we know well, Thomas. Thomas, the apostle, Thomas said he surrendered his life to Jesus. Thomas followed Jesus, saw some of the great miracles that were being done. He basically followed the Lord throughout the entire mission and ministry. Then something happened. Thomas realized that he wasn't fully surrendered because after Jesus was killed on the cross and even at the time before his ascension into heaven, he was doubting. He wasn't really sure. He was just mortified that this great sign of God, Jesus, God in the flesh here in the world, was now gone and he wasn't sure he could handle that. And Thomas was the one who said, until I can put my hands in the wounds of his hands, until I can put my hand in the wound of his side, I'm not sure I can believe. And Jesus called Thomas to a higher level of accountability. Jesus said, Thomas, it is me. And Thomas makes the confession, my Lord, my God. How about Peter? Fleshy or uh, leathery hands, fishy breath, Peter. You know, Peter was the rock upon which Jesus said, I will build this church. I will build my church upon you, Peter. But we learn from Peter's life as well. Peter uh, found himself in that unmistakable moment where surrender was challenged because he was one of the first ones to shout out in the moment that the boat was overcome with a storm, are you sure your God do something about this? Peter is the one who ran away when Jesus needed him the most. Surrender is a challenge sometimes for us. But surrender can be something that God says, in your weakest of moments, I can make it your greatest strength. In all the stories that I've cited to you, in the midst of lack of surrender, each one of those individuals and far more made their life count because they realized what it meant to be an obedient and surrendered relationship with their Lord. Surrender means giving every move in your life to a higher authority. It, mean give, it means giving to the one who is perfect, who will never lead you wrong, and that's what surrender means. It means giving your life to God. Jesus said this. He said, come to me all who are heavy and burdened in life, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what do we learn from Isaiah this morning? Isaiah says there's great hope. Isaiah says that there's no need for us to have cold feet at the altar, that we are to be vibrant, living, moving, life-transforming people of God in the world. And Isaiah says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison, release from the dungeon those who sit in the darkness. It's about obedience. And Isaiah says, obedience is it. So we need to, this morning, begin this half of the year, this moment where we celebrate half of the year gone, and we need to say, I'm making a choice, and I'm going to live into this kind of servant life that Isaiah describes. And he models it after who? Jesus himself. So you and I have a choice today. We can be ourselves, or we can live a life of obedience, live it in the way that the one who became obedient even unto death, death on a cross. Obedience in the name of Jesus Christ.